will come out and give me the same forecast, and you can have some confidence that that's what's going to happen, right? The ensemble, the mean of the ensemble tends to be very, very accurate. On the other hand, if you make small changes and the forecasts are all over the place, then the forecast skill tends to be less. Now, again, you know, I'm going to make fun of my TV meteorology friends around here, but you know, you know, uh, how many of you guys want to get on there? Well, the forecast is this, but my confidence is not very good. <laughs> yeah. I've talked to some of my local friends, like Jeff Renner and PTV. He says, oh, you know, the station manager doesn't like this uncertainty stuff, you know? <laughs> His deep baritone voice. This guy can get out of you. Some of you may not know these people. So, so instead of saying the temperature in two days is going to be 67 degrees, you say, well, it's a 50% probability. It'll be between 64 and 69. Or perhaps a 90% probability it'll be between 62 and, and, and 72. You get the idea? This is what we can do. Okay. A lot more honest than giving you this single number, you know, going on with it, right? So here's my prediction. In 10 years, or maybe less, we're always going to do this. The meteorological profession will be able to produce high resolution, at least 4 or 12 kilometer resolution, probabilistic weather forecasts, and also probabilistic analyses, right? There's uncertainty in even our starting point. And probabilistic forecasts will be available for a wide range of weather parameters. So we're looking to the future now. This is one of the big challenges for my profession to deliver during the next 10 years. But, you know, a big issue is, left is dealing with this probabilistic information. Interestingly enough, producing this probabilistic forecast, this information, is only half the battle. And it's probably the easier half. How do we communicate this uncertain information to people to add some, so they find it useful and, for, and use it for maximum benefit? How can we get you even used to using it? Will you look at it? You know, there's a real issue. Are people ready, are you ready to take on, to use probabilistic weather information? Are you ready for us to stop lying to you? Okay? Oh. No, this guy likes to lie, you know? <laughs> That's, I mean, this is a really serious question. Yeah, it really is. Because in some sense, people are kind of deterministic. I mean, I know somebody, some military folks, that they were, they were trying to push probabilistic prediction, and they, they were trying to give probabilities to their commander. He says, listen, this is your job. I want to know where the, the forecast is going to be, so don't give me any of this, you know, bold, you know, probabilistic stuff. He didn't, he didn't even know what he know. Well, you know, some people feel that way. One weakness that my profession has, that we have to fix, is that there's been amazingly little social science research by the National Weather Service or by anybody else to try to find the best way to communicate forecasts, and particularly how to communicate probabilistic forecasts. Now, now you want me to prove this to you? A case in point is the one parameter that we do forecast probabilistically today. What's the one parameter that you use to probabilities? Precept. Precept, right? Okay. So you'd think we know what we're doing with that, right? And what, 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 me, what meteorologists love to do? We love to give you icons to communicate probability of precipitation. The weather service does icons. Everybody does icons. The weather channel does icons. Here are taken from the National Weather Service website some icons for uh, precipitation. And here's the icon used for 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, and 70%. Now, I'm sure you see the subtle and important differences. <laughs> In fact, you know, Steve can correct me, uh, but uh, my understanding is these icons were, came up with some, with some one of these forecast offices. I think it was in North Carolina, someone came up with these things. Somebody just came up with them, and the weather service took them on. And there was no, no one studied it. There was no psychologist who said, what's the best way to communicate probabilities to people? Okay? Well, of course, you know, University of Washington, we deal with these problems, okay? And I'm proud to say that we have one of the few psychologists in the nation who specialize in this area. Uh, UW psychologist Susan Jocelyn, who I work with closely, we had a project in which she actually investigated a whole range of icons of probability of precipitation. And she had these questionnaires, both online and with students. She, she, she actually went through dozens of icons and now I'm going to show you the most effective icon for, for probability precipitation. Here it is. 
It is one that shows rain drop. It's a pie chart with the probability that we're showing the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, prob the amount of the chart indicates the probability, 10%, so 10% of it is. You explicitly show with shading what's the probability it is not going to rain. And you have the number next to it as well. This was the number one icon. Okay? Well, I mean, this shows you what I mean, we've got to learn how to do this kind of stuff. In fact, um, at the University of Washington, we not only are, you know, we're trying to push it to the future, we not only have an ensemble system that's probably the most advanced in the country, but we also created a website to try to display, to show probabilistic information, probabilistic information in a way that you won't run away from. And this is it, Probcast, www.probcast.com, which has gone down for a few days, but should be back up next week. <laughs> moving, moving, moving to the computer. Now you look at over here. 60, this looks like the stuff you see on TV, right? But it ain't. 66 is the most probable temperature from our ensemble system. And it even gives you the range. There's one chance in 10 it'll be above, what is it, 71. And one chance in 10 it'll be below 62. That's based upon the ensemble uh, information. So what we're trying to do is get this probabilistic information and express it in a way that people can accept. And this is a work in progress. So if you want to see our progress, you go to this PropCast site, okay? We're also playing with this thing. This is another one we're starting to play with. We have all this probabilistic information. People like probabilities. What we're going to create is an app that you can use probabilities to decide what you want to do. You want to go hiking, you want to do something? You say, well, I want to go hiking, but I don't want to do it unless there's, a, there's an 80% chance it won't rain. And I want at least a 50% chance the temple to be above this, you know? Well, that's kind of stuff. You can input it in there, and it'll tell you where to hike. Or where to bicycle ride, or whatever. Right? So red says, don't do it. <laughs> Yellow you know, maybe says, do it. And green says, go. Okay? So maybe this is a way we can avoid all this probability stuff. They'll help you decide to do things. But your decisions will be based on probabilities. Okay. Well, we're, you know, I'm trying to give you the future of Northwest weather prediction. And now I'm going to tell you about another prediction. I'm going to talk about what I call the now casting revolution. Next revolution. So a lot of the stuff I've been talking about forecasts, you know, six hours, 12 hours, two days, four days ahead. But there's another revolution that's short. And I think that's going to be another major revolution. Everybody know what now casting is? Well, now you will. This is the official American Meteorological Society now casting definition. A description of current weather a short-term forecast, very calm, for minutes to a few hours of what's going to happen. Okay? So now casting is knowing what's happening right now and using that information to figure out what's going to happen for the next hour or two. Okay? That's, that's, that's what now casting is. And I'm going to suggest that this is going to be huge. Because during the past decade, we have gained the ability to know what's happening now. Tremendous geographical and temporal specificity. In other words, we really know what's happening now in a way we didn't know 20 years ago. We have high resolution forecasting. We have the numerical models. We have our weather service friends now are forecasting on grids of 5 or 2.5 kilometers. Okay? Um, we have radar data okay? at high resolution over most of the United States, including the coast, okay? which I'm very proud of. In fact, that's one thing I have. My introduction to International Langley Radar. That was my that's a great yeah, for that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a kind of that's that's what the thing I'm most proud of, really. Can you work on one on the Central Oregon coast? Yeah, that's the, well, yeah, that's well. Yeah. <laughs> I can talk about that in questions and answers. <laughs> I, was, I was warned by the head of the Weather Service to keep my mouth shut for a year. <laughs> he said, the Cliff. Got your radar on the Washington coast. Now, don't you go after the Oregon coast yet. <laughs> but your senator was so happy. Yeah. I'll let you guys look at that. We'll get to that. Anyway, we have another change to the number of observations. We have a huge number of observations in the surface. 30 years ago, over Washington State or Oregon, there were maybe 30, 40 stations at airports. Now we have thousands observations each hour. I mean, it's a huge change. 